So um, this is the final presentation. And I'm a little bit wistful, because I don't know when I'll be coming back. I know I'm welcome back, and I'm sure there'll be opportunity for me to come back. Um, but this is my last visit I'm responsible for as part of this um, effort. And um, uh, it's, been a, it's been a great effort. Who was here at the midterm presentation? Please raise, right, raise your hand if you weren't. OK, so it's about a third of you, a little fewer. Um, I'm very aware of the fact that you guys have come, and you've been very loyal. And you keep coming and coming. And, um, and I don't, didn't want to repeat too much. So uh, for the first thing I wanted to do was to, to say that, that I get the glory of standing up here and presenting the plan. Uh, but it was very much a team effort. And uh, this is most of the team uh, that we had with us uh, here in town. And the main person who hopefully job has ended tonight and won't have to keep struggling, uh, who I want to acknowledge, please stand up, is Jeff Souser, who is the project manager for this job. Turn around and say hello. Um, but he's particularly responsible for, for the, the report itself. Um, and then I also want to point out, many of you met uh, David Dixon, who is the principal in charge of uh, urban places at Stantec. Just to clarify, in case, because I think a reporter previously said I worked for Stantec. This is a partnership between <laughs> Spec and Associates uh, and Stantec Urban Places. And when uh, I spoke here and the city expressed an interest in hiring me, uh, I, I often team up with different firms, but I, I, this, this was the, when it's a downtown plan, my A team is the Stantec Urban Places team, and that's why that's the group that uh, joined me uh, working with you uh, here. So um, we are here to present the plan. I'll be giving you a URL at the end, but the plan is actually live. It's online. It's almost uh, not a draft anymore. You will notice the pages say draft on them now, uh, but almost everything is resolved. Uh, and you can look at it. And my goal tonight, I think, among other, among, among other things, is to get you to go online and actually look at the plan. It's too much for me to present. Oh, so, and I want to, to start by saying, I'm presenting the plan, but I want to give you the plan for explaining the plan for downtown Hammond. Because it's really hard what I have to do for you tonight. Because a lot of you were here before. And, and I don't want you to have to see something over and over again. There is a bunch of new stuff. So the stuff I'm showing you tonight is either stuff that's new, or it's stuff that, that really needs to be repeated um, because it's, it's super important. And, and so there is <laughs> this drum up and this, this uh, understanding that we've seen a lot, of, a lot of this before. But anything I'm showing you, again, it's because we've either, we've either modified it, developed it, or it's just a central part of the plan. And there's a lot I won't be showing you. So this is the table of contents from the report. And the table of contents, and roughly my talk tonight, which will not be short, uh, is organized around the context. So what are we starting with? What's surrounding us? What I call the opportunity before. And then this is interesting. I've never done a, a project that we've organized this way, but it's clear there are three phases in which this is going to happen. Or the milestone that's occurring is the arrival of the train. And so those three phases are organized in these three uh, sections before the train, the train, and after the train. And that's, that's uh, important because we don't want to, you know, we felt we need to do like a 20 year plan or at least a 15 year plan because plans like these don't happen too often and you need to plan well into the future so the right stuff happens deep into the future. But actually, that can be distracting from the stuff that we need to have happen right away. So I'll be focusing on the earlier stuff more tonight. Then we went beyond the study area. Jacob Square, in fact, was not part of our initial assignment, but we were excited by it and its opportunity, and some other areas um, outside of the heart of downtown. Then there's implementation, which I'll talk about. A, a specific document I want you to understand called the regulating plan, and, uh, and that's it. So we'll start with context. I am not going to tell you about the context, <laughs> because I've already told you about the context. And you know the, the, where we are. The, the history, good and bad, of your downtown, uh, Hammond, and, uh, and Homan Avenue. Um, and then the process. Whenever you do a plan like this, you also, it's very important to have a very open public process. And the experience we had meeting with you and speaking with you, David Dixon and me, the rapt audiences in the gymnasium, uh, the conversations we had over plans, uh, of course, a lot of time spent in the site and the meetings, and the donuts, and the, um, the open mic nights. So what I really want to talk to you about is, is the opportunity. 
We've alluded to this before. There are really three separate opportunities that together give us hope and confidence that your downtown can become something that it isn't currently. The first is housing demand, the second is the train, and the third is walkability, because you currently don't have it. So let's go through them. Housing demand, Lori uh, described. I don't need to repeat except to, to say that she found and her team found between 115 to 148 um, new houses could land, or new homes, new households could land every year in downtown Hammond. Uh, there it is. And um, that's part of much larger trends that she talked about, that there is a large, there's a large audience uh, for this sort of thing. Uh, we, we're already seeing it happen in other cities in which we're working. This building is, this is a rendering, but this building is now built uh, in Elkhart, where we did, where we did a plan uh, about a year and a half ago. Um, and as we arrived, there were already developers making proposals for sites in Hammond saying, we want to build housing here. So I'm reminded of the value of the housing in your downtown and the fact that, that most downtowns struggle until they have a lot of housing in them. And I may have told you the story, it bears repeating, Jane Jacobs talking about Wall Street in the 19, late 50s actually, said there, there are 400,000 people who come to Wall Street every day to work. Why is there not one good restaurant or one good gym in Wall Street? And it's because it lacked what she called time spread. People during the day, but also people at night. And the people at night come from people living there, not just working there. Uh, the key number we've been hearing recently um, that David Dixon often refers to is once you get 1,000 people within walking distance of a, uh, of a central core, that's when all the, actually, all the leasing experts come in and say, I've got merchants for you. I've got people that want to come in and occupy these spaces. So we'll have 1,000 people living in the downtown core, hopefully in seven or eight years. That's something to be ready for. Um, and it's a very optimistic uh, uh, situation. Next, the train. I've already told you about the train, but you know it's coming. Uh, you know that between um, Hammond Gateway and the South Hammond Station, the, the city finagled to get another stop there. Um, it was always wanted up in this area close to downtown, but when we arrived, it, it, it had been settled, uh, at least for the time, that, that, that this was where it was going to go until with the city, we made one last uh, valiant lobbying effort with NICTI uh, and with their engineers understood why it's important to have the station closer to the heart of downtown and not further, particularly when you have to walk by the, the, the boredom of the mausoleum of the courthouse and other things. Um, and so we managed to move the station and the city invested some money and time in that and it's a wonderful outcome. So that's important because look, with the station headhouse, if you will, at Russell Street, where it's now expected to land, um, within a five minute walk of that is almost the entirety, pretty much the entirety of downtown uh, and some other, including much of State Street, reaching almost all the way to the library, right? It's a five minute walk from the station to the library. So you can see how much is contained in that circle. That's super important and super optimistic. And then finally, walkability. I am not going to tell you about walkability <laughs> because I've done it, right? I've, that's all I do is tell people about walkability, except to remind you that you know, you've got streets with no parking along them to protect the curb. You've got um, uh, five lanes should be 50 feet. It's 62 feet, so your lanes are too wide. You know, there's a reason why people are driving so fast on these streets, and the response is restripe. Don't rebuild, restripe. Except maybe sometimes we should rebuild. And the example, oh, so in the restriping category, I may have showed you before, uh, a project I did in Cedar Rapids where we eventually, it took seven years because they invested nothing in it except for regular maintenance. But over seven years, um, we restriped the whole downtown core um, from a typical street going from this to that, right? Adding, this guy's learning how to not park in a bike lane. Um, <laughs> the cones are temporary because of the construction. But um, that's a very viable solution, and it's the solution that we're proposing for most of your streets, as I'll show you. Um, but then there was this wonderful example I showed you that turns out to be particularly relevant here uh, by our choice in Lancaster, California, where you had a street very similar to Homan, five lanes, uh, speedway, and they did this to it. I've showed you this before, and it was an $11 million investment that reduced crashes by half and pedestrian crashes by three quarters, pedestrian activity doubled. 57 new businesses, 800 new housing units, 2,000 new jobs with an economic impact of $282 million from an $11 million 
uh, city investment. And here's a little zoom in I found. Um, and you can see some of the stuff that got built after that street was put in. This is, I think, is a car festival because notice no one's allowed to park here. There are cars in the middle of the street, um, but the street is closed and pedestrians are filling it. And you can do that with a street like this because there's parallel routes. And then information that I didn't have last time, but I was very curious to learn, this street handled 15,000 cars per day before the change. Homan handles 15,000 cars per day. After the change, because there were parallel roads, like you have parallel roads, after the change, it now handles 11,000 cars per day. And the idea was some of that traffic would shift to parallel roads so the city could have a heart, right? And that's a smart thing to do because it's not the only street through the town, just like Homan is not the only street through your town. So it's an interesting thing to note that we actually accepted a slight reduction in capacity, which your leaders are willing to do in order to bring a downtown uh, back to life. Now, I mentioned the three phases, before the train, the train, and after the train. We'll start with before the train, and I'm gonna be pointing out just the main, uh, the main items that are featured in the plan. First, this map, this very limited map of the downtown, contains within it almost everything that's in this before the train category. It's really important to focus. If we do a bunch of good things that are scattered or dispersed, they're not gonna create that critical mass that's gonna make your downtown change. And so we're focused on Homan Avenue at the Rimbach intersection um, and this opportunity now for housing. This proposal was, um, was from one of a number of developers who's interested in building a lot of houses in the downtown on that large parking lot that's just right across Homan Avenue um, from this building. And um, the way this works, just to clarify, there's a strong demand for housing in the, in the downtown. But it's very expensive to build new housing in the downtown. If developers were to build that housing, this housing, and get their money back with a normal suitable profit, the rents would be higher than the market would allow. So what happened, for example, in Elkhart with that project I showed you, and what was proposed here, and will be proposed here by any developers who want to get involved, is that the city has to participate. The city has to do a limited amount of subsidy in order to uh, make that happen. We regularly advise cities that that's a good choice, that's a wise choice because of the outcomes are much, much greater, much more beneficial uh, than the cost. However, we were concerned that the cost would be much higher, maybe $5 million higher, because of a parking structure in the site. And we also found that there's ample reason to put a surface parking lot back here across the street from the very large surface parking lot uh, in front of the retail. Um, and so we proposed a new shape to the building. Um, and we have now created a, a vision for that building. Now this is just a vision, right? When you do a plan, you, you try to show the best case scenario, and then you try and regulate away any of the worst case scenarios. And I'll be showing you the regulating plan at the end. But what I wanted to communicate is that we're very excited about a building that pulls back from a corner in order to frame a plaza that I'll tell you about, uh, and then has about 200 units, which is about what this building had in it, right? So that's, um, that's a, a year and a half's worth of units, perhaps, uh, in the downtown, um, and uh, uh, holds the edge of the street, creates a really nice edge on Homan, where it's currently missing, um, and the way that we like to see these buildings designed these days, because they're very large, is it's one building, but it's broken up to look like it's multiple buildings. So you see you have a feeling of row houses here, a feeling of rows at row houses here. Um, these two buildings match. We thought it would be great to have an arcade along the edge with balconies for hanging out right above to give more life to the square. If there's people hanging out there in the nice weather. And then these buildings tend to have courtyards in the middle for amenities. Um, wouldn't it be great if there was a passage through uh, into that courtyard? So that's our proposal um, for that building. I'll talk about the plaza more in a minute. There's also the Bank Calumet building. A number of entities have expressed interest in, uh, in, in rehabilitating this and also putting housing in it. It's one of a dozen buildings in the downtown that could be, the, that, that already exist that could hold housing. We think that's an, another important uh, angle for the city to, pr to pursue is to bring housing into this building as well. Um, the next big move, which is probably the biggest move, which is the one that we're most excited about, is Homan Avenue itself. You know, you come off this bridge and 
this happens. I was telling the documentarians earlier today. You come off the bridge, and all these bridges over railroads or whatever, in any city, you name it, Memphis or, or Tulsa, they're, they're, they're designed like highways. They're designed for super high speed. And you land at high speed coming downhill. And of course, you enter the downtown, and you just want to speed right through it. Um, and that's why a solution like the one I showed you in, in, in uh, Lancaster um, makes sense. Uh, that's Lancaster. And this is what we're proposing. This is one of two solutions. We initially proposed six. We narrowed it down to two. Um, this is one of them. It's the same solution as Lancaster, except because your street's a little bit narrower, it's not two, it's not parked and parked. It's just one car thick, angle parked in the middle of the street, parallel parked on the side of the street. You can see how it works there. Now, this was the other finalist. And it's still in play, I have to admit. It's still in play. And what this one shows is a central median with trees, parallel parking alongside two drive aisles. But what it does is it separates out protected bike lanes on this street. This street is a bike route. It's a trajectory that bikes are going to want to take. And we were very concerned about it as a bike route because angle parking, um, when it's front in angle parking, is dangerous for bikes. There was a study, whoop, try again. There was a study that was done in, um, in Tucson. But you can see how when the cars are backing up into the bike lane, that's not a safe condition. But when the, the, the parking is rear in, it is a very safe condition. In Tucson, Arizona, the fr they had front end parking and they were having one car bike crash per week on the street in Tucson. They changed it to back in and there were no car bike crashes ever again. So it's an important distinction. I always, sometimes people do it wrong, right? <laughs> I don't know how we did that. Um, probably from the other way. But I always tell cities, you should have rear angle parking, but I don't want to be the one who brings it to you. Because people, like, it takes a while to get used to and people don't like it. But here in this case, because we want to have a lot of parking and because we want bikes in the street, I really think it's the right solution. And here's how I can justify it to myself and hopefully to you. It's all extra parking. The people who don't know how can just park where they parked before. The skillful people with, with talent <laughs> can angle park in the middle of the street. But I really prefer, because, it's, because compared to the other one, which, feels, which protects the bikes, but it's all about motion. This is about creating a plaza that you also happen to drive in and park in. And that's why I have to admit, I was trying not to lead the jury, but I really prefer this solution. And I hope this is the solution. Um, and if it is the solution, I can reveal to you the new rendering. We we're featuring the EAT establishment. But notice, before and after, it's the same view. And um, the other thing that happens is the red light turns green. I've got a great renderer. <laughs> David Carrico, turn the red light green. Um, but you see how it works. You have bollards, planters. In these little triangular leftover areas, you have a tree between every car. And they're small trees, but together they make a forest, uh, just like you saw in Lancaster. The only section that would be asphalt would be the drive aisle. This would be some sort of textured pavement, the same thing here. Cobble around the trees. You can see how that will transform your downtown. And we think it's the right choice uh, to do. Next are the other streets. So in this area, we have Homan. And I'll explain to you what this map means at the end. But we have Homan. But we also have Sibley, Rimbach, Fayette, and Russell. Fayette hardly has to change, but Sibley, Rimbach, and Russell are all striped in a way that's encouraging high-speed motion. So um, this is Homan now, and then there's also Homan on the bridge and beyond the downtown core. And we're planning to do this, uh, this plaza street for just about four blocks. Beyond it, it could still be improved. Um, this is on the bridge. It's four lanes, but when it lands, it really only needs to be one lane in each direction plus the opportunity to turn, right? So we're turning it to a three-lane road uh, with a shared turn lane in the center. And that gives us room to continue the, you know, there's a, this is a bike route through your city, but we can have the bike route be a protected cycle track on one side of the street. South of Clinton, where this plaza ends, it's, a four, it's currently five, it's currently um, let me see if I get this right. 
It's currently five lanes, but the traffic on it, 15,000 cars per day, you can handle 18,000, 20,000 cars per day with a three-lane street. So we're changing the five lanes to three lanes, and that gives us opportunity then to put protected uh, bikes, or at least buffered bike lanes, on either side of the street. Yeah. Yes? How do you get the, when you're leaving a bike path going north on home and edge of the bridge, how do you get the bike safely over on the one side? So I was thinking that as I was speaking and chose not to say it. But <laughs> there will be, I don't think, I may not have the drawing that shows it, but there will be a special, uh, uh, here at Sibley, there will be a special bike signal that's bikes only that makes that, makes that transition. Um, so the street network is changing uh, from this current condition to this condition where we're taking a fair amount of traffic off, off of home. And, and I'm, I'm very sensitive to the fact that, that people who are in a hurry may not want to delight in the plaza street that is the new home and avenue. And so I came up with this new sign, and I'm, I'm perfectly serious about this, that says, in a hurry. And actually, when you're coming from the, when you're coming from the south, when you're coming from the south, it would say in a hurry, Seoul Avenue, or you could take a left up here to get to State Line. When you're coming from the north, it would say in a hurry, State Line, State Line Road. But there's ample opportunity to just get on that parallel road. State Line has a ton of capacity that's not being used. And then there's the signalization currently, and you've heard me talk before about how when you change a signalized intersection to a stop sign intersection, you actually reduce um, severe crashes by about two thirds. Um, so this is the proposal, which is principally for this stretch in which we're plazifying um, Homan, that the signals would become instead always stop signs. And I want to I want to mention when I when I talk about that, people are concerned because they think, oh, it's going to slow me down. I have to stop at every intersection. But you'll never be waiting at an intersection. I did a downtown uh, uh, walkability study for Albuquerque. In that study, I recommended turning all of these signals into stop, always stop signs to improve the safety. They did it to nine of them, and there was a backlash, and they undid them. And then there was a backlash, backlash, <laughs> because people realized, this is from the local news channel, to reduce, tra to reduce not just speeding, but traffic pileup. The traffic was worse with the signals than with the stop signs, because people were sitting and waiting. So actually, it doesn't mean, just because you're moving slowly through the downtown, doesn't mean you'll be moving, you'll, you'll be taking more elapsed time to get through the downtown. I wanted to make that clear. Um, then there is Rimbach Street and Russell Street. <clears throat> oh, and Sibley Street. So Sibley Street is another street that's, that's striped pretty high speed. It has two 11-foot lanes, 10 feet is the standard, and then a 20-foot lane going in the other direction. That's too wide. So we make two 10-foot lanes a parking lane, and that allows us to take that one-sided cycle track, and uh, that one side of the street two-way cycle track, and run it east-west on Sibley. So that's important. And then there's Russell. Russell is currently one way. It's going to have to change when the train station comes. But generally, changing from two-way to one, from one way to two-way makes streets safer. In this case, you've got two very wide lanes, not allowed to park. We're going to make it two-way and have parking on both sides. So that's the plan for Russell. And then finally, there's Rimback, which comes in in this swoop. So the first thing to, to think about is, OK, what's the measurements? We've got a 14-foot lane, a 12-foot lane, a 13-foot lane. If you right-size those to 10 feet, you're allowed to get parking on one side. Great, we've done that. But what about this swoop? And you know, it's funny, why is this Rimback and this is Fayette? Because they used to be two entirely different streets. Rimbach came in straight like this, right, aiming at these buildings. And at a certain point, the traffic engineers, as they did in every city, don't feel bad, said, hey, wouldn't it be great to be able to swoop through, stay on the street, simplify the intersection? Unfortunately, whenever you put swoops in city centers, they become faster and, and feel, feel more highway-like. Um, and uh, that's a problem. So when we first did the plan, we accepted the Rimbach swoop until we did a little bit of research with our engineers and with the folks at Structure Point who are local. And we found out that actually, because the street used to sit here, it would be relatively inexpensive to, to put it back there. And so the plan now is to, as part of this reconstruction, is to bring Rimbach back in straight. And you know, not that many people are making this motion. Most people are turning from either street. Um, it's not going to slow things down very much, especially because the stop sign motion there, which is, is um, it's easy to take turns when you have an always stop sign. 
So the other big thing that's happening then is that that creates, it moves the plaza. So the plaza is currently here, and it's poorly defined. It doesn't have good edges. It's weirdly shaped. It's kind of hanging out there. Uh, and we're going to, you know, we're going to have to rebuild the basin. But that, that sculptural, that, that actually world-known uh, sculpture that sits on top of it can just be lifted up and moved. And it's a feature then of this plaza that we're putting uh, attached in front of the apartment house. Attached plazas are much better at attracting people than detached plazas that are in the middle of streets because you can serve them food and drink from the edges and they have that life uh, right on them. And we're, we're confident that when it's sitting in this environment as opposed to the old environment that the fountain will be used by more than people who need, need to get cleaned up, right? Um, and then there's extra sites that are available that don't have a lot of parking capacity available to them. And that's where we recommend the row houses, because row houses park very simply and easily, you know, one spot uh, per small row house. But I want to call your attention to this spot here. And this is the alley um, behind Paul Henry's uh, art gallery, which, you know, is already a real uh, a center of, of gathering and community and of the arts. And it's a great space. And you're probably aware that cities all over have started to remake their alleys into kind of these places for hanging out, for having sidewalk dining, for having events. So we're rebranding re, re, we're, we're re this as Arts Alley. And we're um, going to hope, or, or, or you know, over time, put together a program where artists are encouraged to decorate that alley in different ways, on the ground, on the walls. Um, but then also, the row houses that are right here, I think I have it in the plan, right here could actually be kind of live work, live work row houses where folks are encouraged to have businesses there. And we're hoping that this could become kind of the next uh, great kind of intimate public space in your downtown. That's before the train. The train. When the train, now, and I should say, so this, this the stuff I've all showed you, we hope, we hope to see it happen in the next three to five years. The train, the, we don't know exactly when it's going to arrive, but five years is possible, seven years is possible, hopefully somewhere in that range. Um, once this work is done, there'll be work to do to prepare for the train. And we want this work to be done as the train arrives, not subsequently, um, to allow the train station to function. So the key thing right now is, you know, Fayette Street crosses the tracks and Russell Street crosses the tracks. The train station is going to come. It's going to be rising, and you can't go through it here. And then you will be able to get under it at Fayette. What's really cool about your downtown is you have this crank in the grid. One of the best things about, about um, your Main Street is when you look down at it, you don't, see the whole, you don't see the horizon at the end of the prairie. You actually see that crank right on home and that encloses the space and makes it more comfortable. But it also represents a crank in your grid. And we can take advantage of that crank to pull this street in perpendicular to Fayette and then create a lovely triangular square up against the train tracks. This is the line. Right? It aims at the county. I would love to see this made better looking with artwork. But it aims at the front of the county courthouse like that. Right? There it is. And there's opportunity then on these smaller sites for row houses. But this is the next big incursion, another 200 units of housing in, in your downtown. And these would come, you know, these would come before the train, hopefully after the first 200 units of housing are all leased up after a couple years. There's also this important garage, which um, allows this to happen, because between this garage and this open parking field, there's enough parking for the whole area that surrounds it. So um, this is a view now looking north. The, there's the, the plaza. This is the second big incursion of housing in the downtown. You see row houses framing the street here. Also a few there, visible in the background. Um, you see a train station we'll talk about in a second. It's basically just the way to get up to the train, but we make it look beautiful. Um, and then the plaza, there's not just the, the main street cutting through, there's also a little loop for drop-offs. So if you want just to drop someone off at the train, that's where you would go. So there you see it there, the loop. And here's the view now, looking down Russell Street like this at that building which terminates the vista, celebrates the arrival of the train, uh, and gets you up to the level of the train tracks. Here are the row houses 
Here are the apartments. And then on the plaza now, there's a more green area, which is the larger area for sitting and relaxing. And there's a more paved area, which is a smaller area for uh, more active uh, hanging out. And we, we, we're proposing a kind of a cheap, maybe not temporary, but a cheap, quickly built prefab building on this edge that can hold the, you know, the donut shop and the other services that the arrival of the train will hopefully cause to succeed. And you see that right there. Green and plaza together make a square. Now, this work is going to mean that your, your bike network changes. Uh, this is your current bike network downtown. And you know, cities that invest in bicycling are getting bicycling. That's the, that's the math. If you invest in bicycling, you get bicycling. The existing, aside from your lovely paths, right, your, your Monon and Erie Lackawanna trails, aside from that, your only bike facilities are either a signed bike route, which is like, here's a sign saying it's a bike route, good luck, or a shared lane, which is a share row which really isn't a dedicated space. So you can see there's actually very few true bicycle facilities. And so you either have, you either have the path or you know, this is what you see happening. Because certainly it's not safe on the street. Now, one of the streets that the mayor mentioned was Douglas Street. It's four lanes. It doesn't need to be four lanes. So we're proposing that it go from, um, well, that's interesting. This shows it as three. We may have to fix that. Or I just may have the wrong image up. But uh, this is what it can become, is two lanes and then buffered bikes on each, on each side. And so the bike map, when we're done with the different things I've showed you already and with, with Douglas, it will be this. And what you see in green is, uh, is protected bike lanes, um, and, and brown is also protected buffered bike lanes. So it's a much more robust plan. That's the stuff that's associated with the train. Now, it's a lot of stuff, but this is the stuff that's about five years after the first phase I've shown you. Then there's after the train. And I'm not going to tell you about after the train, <laughs> because time is limited, and I want you to focus on the, the first phase and maybe the second phase. So I'm not going to tell you about the plans for buildings we have further south on Homan or further east on Douglas. When the train station arrives, these sites will be more uh, valuable. Up on State Street, where there's all sorts of opportunity um, for infill. But we can talk about that later, because it's not going to happen for some time. And I'm not going to tell you about beyond the study area, um, because I don't want to distract you with our wonderful infill plan uh, for Jacobs Square and the, the playground that we're proposing for the center of it and the housing types that we're proposing that look like single family houses but are actually row houses where the fronts stick forward so that when you're looking down the street they don't appear to be row houses so they fit in better um, with, the existing, with the existing fabric. And I'm definitely not going to tell you about Oakley Avenue which we striped during the charrette and they already did it and you don't have to clap again but this is an example, this is an example of how Hammond gets things done. The street was newly paved uh, when we arrived, and before long, uh, we proposed striping for it, and it was inst instigated. Now, implementation, I'm not going to say much, except that uh, on our team was a woman named Beth Elliott, and this is Beth. And Beth worked, um, studied this area quite closely, and what, what the report includes are, f I think, five separate pages of block grants, tax increment financing opportunities, home funds, the recreational trail program, item after item, build grants, basically finding ways to fund this work, but particularly finding ways to fund the, the, the rehabilitation of your existing buildings. Because that's, that's, that's the stuff that really needs help, but it's also the stuff where there's, there's much more funding available to rehabilitate historic buildings than there is to build new. And so uh, that's a part of the plan, another page. And then I did want to show you the regulating plan. <coughs> So everything I've been showing you is what we call an, an illustrative plan or an illustration plan. It shows what we consider the ideal build out of the site. But you know, there's, there's what you want to see, and there's what you propose and hope that people emulate in your plan. But then there's like what you can control. And what you can control is much less, and you want it to be less, because you don't want to, to, to you know, tie the hands of developers. You want to control the aspect of, of future development that truly impacts the quality of the public realm. So what is that? And it looks like this. This is the north half and this is the south half. But you can see that we're, we're, we have frontage standards. Anywhere, that, anywhere that's solid 
is what we call primary frontage. The buildings need to pull up to that line. They can't sit back, they can't not be there. The dotted areas, like around the parking lots, are secondary frontage. What happens there is much less regulated. Anywhere that's a public space that we want people to hang out in, be it Holman Avenue or the new Rimbach Plaza or you know, eventually down on State Street, that is regulated to a higher degree. Um, also, you'll notice in red, there are certain places where retail, we feel, has to be. Um, and it's not required in other places. You see, for example, the few places where curb cuts, right, driveways, are allowed. They're not allowed anywhere else. You see these little, these little arrows? These are, vis these are called vista terminations. As you look up home and from the south, there's an incredible amount of heat. And you know, the, your, your, your perspective terminates on this location. And here, you're being viewed both up high from Homan and from Fayette, right? So these are places where architects are required to put some feature on the building that will receive uh, that vista. And then the heights of the buildings are also regulated within a range. It's a pretty wide range. Um, we don't want them to get too high because we want, the, we want it to spread out and cover a lot of property, right? So we don't want any one building to be too tall. So that's all regulated in this plan for the north area and the south area. Um, and oh yeah, here's where I'm, I've zoomed in. Um, and then there's about 10 pages of development standards. Uh, for example, each of the civic spaces and structures is named and described in the most limited way, but the what matters. You know, the civic space shall place the existing street trees along the Homan Avenue frontage into an expanded sidewalk. The civic space shall create a plaza at the southeastern corner of the site, replacing the civic space lost due to the realignment of Rimbach Street. The plaza shall be predominantly hardscaped with the relocated fountain, a splash garden, and a surrounding tree canopy. That's all. That's the extent to which we're controlling it. Beyond that, you know, knock yourself out. But um, there's about 10 pages of this sort of regulation, including of private buildings, because that's what codes can do. Um, and that's the whole report. That's everything. I'm almost done. I'm not entirely done. That's the master plan. And I wanted to call your attention, easy to remember, you can find it online now at gohammond.com slash downtown. And I hope, I hope when tonight's over, you go home, have a nightcap, and open up the plan and, and, and get, get your own sense of it. But I, I wanted to end with an ask because um, it's very clear, and, and with the city's participation, that this plan does rely on, on city investment. So the time for me to mention that is here in front of all of you so that you're hopefully convinced that this investment is worth it and you support your leaders when they make the effort to fund this through city council or any other uh, um, you know, hoops that they have to jump through. I want you on their side, right? So what are the five investments that I think will really kick this off uh, and get it started? The 200 apartments, Bank Calumet Building, Homan Avenue itself, Rimbach Plaza, and restriping just four streets. So just to, just to recap, the 200 units of housing, the city is already preparing an RFP to go out to developers for their proposals for what to do, this, do for this site. Our regulating plan is attached to that RFP. It is likely the developer will need a subsidy to do this work, and that's as it, as it always has been in, in these markets. We, we recommend that. Secondarily, the Bank Calumet building, we feel it's located at the key intersection of you know, Rimbach, Fayette, and, and Homan, and uh, it's ready to go, and investors are interested, but that will probably need some city help to happen. Third, Homan Avenue itself, four blocks of this. This is the largest investment. I'm not gonna tell you it's cheap. I really believe it's worth it. And then, in association with that, the Rimbach Plaza, pulling the swoop out, making Rimbach straight. When this building is, oh, and I should say, I forgot to mention this, the, the RFP is, isn't just for this site, it's for this missing tooth right here. You may be able to picture there's a parking lot right there. A plaza is only as good as its edges. If this building is not let as part of the same RFP as this building, it probably won't get built for many years. And it's super important to surround this plaza with lively buildings. So the RFP is actually for these two sites uh, together. And then finally, restriping only four streets in addition, Homan on the bridge, and, and below, it makes sense to do that sooner rather than later. Sibley, which I showed you. Fayette is fine. Rimbach, which you know about, and, and Russell Street. So that makes up the whole 
the whole first phase. Now, that's a lot of money, <laughs> and I want to talk about why this is important. Because in a lot of cities, particularly here, right, nobody lives in, almost nobody lives in your downtown. And often when you're making plans for cities, plans for downtowns, people come in and say, why are you investing all that money in your downtown? No one lives there. You know, we live in another neighborhood. Our neighborhood needs help. You know, why, why are you doing that? And the answer is that, that actually the downtown is the one part of your city that belongs to everybody. Right? Wherever you may find your home, you've got that space, but you've also got the downtown too, if you think about it. And in that way, investing in the downtown is actually the only place-based way to benefit all of, all of your citizens at once. But, but you know, more than that, any, anyone who's thinking about relocating to your city, be it a college graduate or a corporation, you know, they have an image of your city in mind. That image is, 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 is palpable, it's powerful, it's a very physical image. It's an image of streets and buildings and squares and cafes and the social life that those places engender. That image inevitably, with rare exception, is the downtown of the city. If your downtown has a good image, a good look, a good feel, a good life, then your city has a good image. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. So I really think the future of your city, I know from experience, the future of your city is, is going to ride on the, especially as we become more urban and people want to live more urban lives, the future of your city is going to depend on the future of your downtown. Uh, if you want to keep thriving uh, and enjoy the successes that you've seen, um, I think that's the direction you need to go into. And that's why we work so hard on this plan. And very grateful for your attention and thank you.